Since the Super Tucano can be easily shot down, it is indeed a great aircraft and in this video Millennium is going to explain why. Since he shot a terrible introduction, he asked me to save the day. You must understand him, he is a man of a certain age, and his condition is no longer at the top. Oh, this what the f Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. And please stay with me till the end, because as usual, the stuff that we are going to discuss today is not easy to find anywhere else on YouTube. The Super Tucano, which is also known as the A29, is a light attack turboprop built by the Brazilian Embraer. Recently, it was in the news because one aircraft has been captured intact in Afghanistan. The first flight of a fully configured Super Tucano uh, happened in 1999 and since then has been adopted by many countries beside Brazil. In 2013 the Super Tucano was declared the winner of the US light air support competition, not without controversies. 20 of these aircraft were purchased by the United States to be donated to the Afghan Air Force. The Super Tucano is a derivation of the even more popular trainer Embraer 3112 Tucano. Compared to the trainer, the Super Tucano has an engine twice as powerful, slightly improved aerodynamics, a strengthened landing gear and in general a stronger structure, and two 50 cal machine guns in the wings exactly in the same way an aircraft in World War II would have had. The aircraft has been equipped with a modern combat system and a lot of modern uh, weapons have been integrated with it. Actually, you would not expect to find a turboprop aircraft with such a large variety of systems. The aircraft has a flight computer, an armament computer, multifunctional displays similar to what you can find in the average fourth generation fighter, all of this mostly provided by Israeli industries. The aircraft also has a database integrating all the computers in standard uh, MIL-STD 1553, which makes the integration of every uh, Western weapon pretty much uh, straightforward. There are five hard points, each one of them actually connected with the database, so the aircraft can use targeting pods, guided weapons, and a large variety of uh, stores. However, you can find this information anywhere. There is really no need to get into too much detail about this aircraft. What we're interested in is the concept behind it and its role in modern warfare. Because despite being nothing new, ET is really something new. In the jet era, the light trainer jet soon emerged as the platform required to train the pilot for the new propulsion. These aircraft were designed to be less resource intensive and cheaper than frontline jets, but also easy to fly for the novice pilots. Obviously, the performance was not the same as a frontline jet, but it was also clear that these aircraft could be adapted in the light attack role in a scarcely contested airspace. And in fact, since World War II, there have been plenty of conflicts where these aircraft have been uh, the main air asset for one of the participants. They seem to be the ideal solution for minor air forces with low technology opponents. So everything seems linear. Low tech against low tech, high tech against high tech. Simple, isn't it? Well, not quite. One of the staples of the Italian aerospace industry during the Cold War was the Aermacchi MB339. Uh, it was a light trainer that has a reasonably good international success. For example, it was used by Eritrea in the conflict against Ethiopia in the light attack role. But look at what the Argentinians did at the Falklands. 
The Argentine Navy had 10 units in operation since 1981. They were used as trainers for the pilots later transitioning to the A4 or the Super Etandard. When it was clear that the British were going to recover the islands with force, six of these aircraft have been deployed at Port Stanley directly on the islands. And actually the Argentine Air Force did the same, not deploying frontline aircraft on the islands, but rather relying on the light attack Pucara aircraft. This choice really begs a question. If they really wanted to defend the islands, why send trainers? The MB339 had fired the shots only during the cadets training. It, they were not even part of a combat unit. Why deploy them rather than, for example, a small group of A4s, an old aircraft, but definitely more capable in combat? Well, there were surely logistical problems in ensuring the operational support to the aircraft, but the main reason was different. The reason was they were expendable, or like we say today, attritable. The loss of training assets would not have really damaged the Argentinian Navy because everybody knew that the war was not going to last years, so there was not going to be the necessity to train. On the other side, a lucky 339 could have neutralized a British ship, making the exchange between a ship and an aircraft definitely worthwhile. And the exchange was going to happen sooner or later because between the 339 and the Sea Harrier, well, definitely it wasn't a fair fight. This concept was clear during the years of the Cold War and it was commonly accepted as I was explaining to Otis at the beginning of the video. Every Air Force had a larger servo trainer jet that could be used according to this logic. Of course, at first they would have replaced more capable aircraft in secondary roles, but if it was necessary, they would have been deployed at the front. Every time the exchange loss would have been judged to be favorable, this would have happened. Obviously, this is a terrible policy, horrible, but such is the nature of the decisions that are taken during a war. Losses are going to happen and the only problem is if the exchange is acceptable or not. And during the Cold War, this was accepted at all levels. For example, even the A-10 units knew that during a war in Central Europe, they would probably have lasted two or three weeks, no more. An aircraft like the Super Tucano is quintessentially expendable. It is relatively cheap to acquire, about $10 million a, a piece, obviously depends from the configuration, and, but it is also very, very cheap to fly. But since it can be integrated with modern precision guided weapons, it really may have an effective hit to sortie ratio. So being fully capable of operating in austere environment with primitive support, it should also be capable of generating a high number of sorties. I suspect it could be more efficient than a jet train and hastily equipped with some weapons. The Super Tucano is a true attack aircraft, albeit it has relatively low flying performances. Plus, I'm pretty sure that the ground forces would love it. So there is no doubt that it makes sense for counterinsurgency and for permissive environments in general. It has been very successful. There have been a lot of sales against these requirements. Would it make sense in a high intensity conflict? Probably not, because it would be quickly wiped out of the sky by higher performance aircraft. But an aircraft like this can be produced in numbers. Pilots are quick and easy to train if compared to jet pilots. And you can lose an aircraft without worrying too much. So why investing heavily in a treatable unmanned drone uh, artificial intelligence driven platform 
when this is promptly available i realize it is not exactly the same thing and the overlap is definitely not complete but you can probably buy five or six of these for the average four plus plus generation fighter probably even more with little opposition this would be extremely capable freeing the high performance aircraft for the missions where they are really needed in a contrasted environment with men on board it was still probably be more efficient than a drone being intelligent it would be less vulnerable and in the worst case the pilots can jump out of the plane without thinking twice the loss would not have been that bad so it may be worth asking the question would the exchange rate of this aircraft in a relatively high intensity conflict be acceptable I am personally not sure of the answer, but I believe it is a question that is worth asking. But there's more. In a long conflict, an aircraft like this is probably the only type of aircraft that can be produced in large numbers indefinitely. The aeronautical industries in the world can probably build two or three thousand aircraft a year if pushed to the max capacity. In a generalized conflict, you can lose two or three thousand aircraft in a month. Obviously, I'm considering both sides. Aircraft like the Tucano, or in general, simple turboprop light jet aircraft can be replaced very, very easily, particularly if you give for granted that they are going to last a couple of hundred hours and that in a way or another, they are going to be destroyed. In this way, you don't need to design the aircraft to have a long life, so you can cut a lot of corners. So a big part of this video is actually my speculation and I can be completely wrong. But I can't help thinking if it would make sense to have aircraft like the Tucano being the lowest combat tier of a modern air force. However, I fully understand that a position like this can be very unpopular among the professionals, but also among us who are just passionate fans and observers. Thank you for watching and see you next time.